This Filmmaker IQ lesson is sponsored by Panamorph. We bring cinema home. Welcome to FilmmakerIQ.com. I'm John Hess, and today we'll look at the history of home theaters, bringing movies from the Cineplex into the living room. In our world of Vimeo, YouTube, Netflix, and Hulu, virtually anything you want to see is just a click away. Never before has so much content been available to so many with such ease. So as we begin our journey winding back the clock to the beginning of the previous century, we have to imagine a different time and a different relationship to media. Movies began in the Nickelodeon, a term that mashed up the word nickel and odeon, a Greek word for a theater for musical performances. In 1905, for just five cents, audiences could be entertained with a variety of short films and live acts. Nickelodeons were a major part of the American culture, with an estimated 8,000 Nickelodeons in the U.S. by 1908, and 26 million regular attendees by 1910. But as quickly as the Nickelodeons exploded on the American consciousness, they quickly went away. As a network of film distribution came into place, theaters found that audiences tended to favor the feature-length film, and you didn't need those live vaudeville acts. Of course, the longer films were more expensive to make. Prices for admission necessarily skyrocketed, doubling to 10 cents. But now you are seeing feature films with a couple shorts made with great skill and craft in a much more elegant setting. The mindset of the time demonstrated by this ad from 1915 from a small, unknown upstart, Paramount Pictures. Here, casting off the old, dingy Nickelodeons of the past for the new Paramount Pictures Movie Palace. So, for a generation or two, movies were something you got out of the house and you went to. Only the rich collectors had home movie projectors, and private collections of films were mostly scraps, interesting bits from films here and there to show off their friends at dinner parties. Even the filmmakers themselves saw little value in their films once the screenings were done. Part of the problem was the inherent danger of storing old film. Nitrate film was used at the time, which was extremely flammable, which it would even burn underwater. And as the stuff decayed, it turned to essentially gunpowder, leading to some famous unfortunate accidents, such as the fire in 1937 at 20th Century Fox Studios, which wiped out all of their pre-1935 film stock. The fact was, studios just needed more storage space for new films and not for archives. So they just destroyed their old films. An estimated 90% of all silent films ever made are considered lost and gone forever. Even though television had been invented and regular public broadcasts started by the BBC as early as 1929, the Great Depression and World War II prevented TV from becoming an everyday household appliance until the late 1940s. But television became a great mass-produced product as the economy turned from guns to butter in the post-war years. And the American public served as a great consumer base as the baby boom shifted populations away from the cities and into suburbia. TV was an easy and free delivery tool of entertainment straight into the suburban home. Unfortunately, movie theater attendance plummeted, dropping 50% from 1946 to 1955. At first, the movie studios tried to get in on this TV action, but the FCC was hesitant to hand out broadcasting licenses to movie companies that had just lost a Supreme Court antitrust lawsuit in 1948 over their anti-competition practices in dealing with the movie theaters. Instead, it was the radio broadcasters, CBS, NBC, and ABC, who got in on the television game. So immediately, Hollywood saw TV as head-on competition, and they responded by entrenching themselves and refusing to sell rights to the movies for broadcasts and forbidding their stars from appearing on this new electronic medium. The numbers were grim. Ticket sales were way down. Productions slowed to a crawl, and the studios levied heavy layoffs. At the close of the 40s, it looked like Hollywood was about to implode with TV laying down the final straw. But out of challenge comes innovation. 
To compete with television, the clever filmmakers changed tack and focused on what they could do better, spectacle. Widescreen aspect ratios first popularized by Cinerama in 1952 and Cinemascope in 1953, stereo and multi-channel surround sound, larger screens going from 30 foot to the 50 foot screens, full adoption of color, and even the first wave of 3D. Many of the aspects of our modern film experience began as a way to get people away from their homes, away from their TV sets, and into the theater. But Film's little brother television still had grander aspirations, and they wanted to be in the movies. The broadcasters had a lot of time to fill. Why not show an old movie and sell ad space? Now, for the newer, leaner Hollywood, which grew out of the devastation of the late 40s, TV wasn't seen so much as competition, but as a new revenue stream with studios beginning to sell rights to television as early as 1956. And then on September 23rd, 1961, NBC premiered Saturday Night at the Movies, featuring the 1953 film How to Marry a Millionaire, starring Marilyn Monroe, Lauren Bacall, and Betty Grable. Broadcast in living color, How to Marry a Millionaire was the second film to be made in the widescreen cinemascope. Unfortunately for viewers at the time, the film was severely pan and scan, the process of zooming in and lopping off the sides of the image in order to fill a 4-3 screen with a portion of the original 2.35 aspect ratio image. This wrecks havoc on the original composition, oftentimes losing actors who are positioned on the edge of the screen. Regardless, Saturday Night at the Movies was a big success, leading to countless spin-offs from all the broadcasters, practically one for each night of the week. Now, the studios had finally found value in their old catalogs, and television had found relatively cheap content to fill time. But most importantly, a major social shift was occurring, this idea that now you could stay at home and catch a movie, an idea that would cement itself in the world's conscience with the introduction of tape. Videotape for professional broadcast use was invented by the Ampex Corporation in 1956, but the machines and the tape reels were far too expensive for personal use. Consumer electronics would catch up in 1970 when Sony released the U-Matic, a system designed for home use that recorded onto bulky three-quarter inch tapes. This was followed by the short-lived Cartravision in 1972, and then came the Big Two, the famous format war. In 1975, the Sony Betamax, followed a year later by JVC's VHS in 1976. Now the technological stage was set for watching movies at home, on demand. But studios didn't realize the potential market yet. When tape was originally sold to consumers, it was as a way for viewers to time shift their favorite programs, recording shows to be watched later. Cartravision had dabbled in a rental system with movies on pre-recorded tapes, but the company folded soon after their launch, so nothing came of it. There just didn't seem to be any interest in actually selling movies on tape. Well, that changed in 1977 when Andrew Blay of Magnetic Video convinced a financially struggling 20th Century Fox to license 50 of their titles to be released on pre-recorded Betamax and VHS tapes. A Blaze company took off and the film video tape market was born, sparking off the video rental industry. At first, Hollywood assumed that people were only interested in renting films, but it didn't take long for studios to realize there was some serious money to be made in stocking up people's personal video libraries. Distributors cut the price of videotapes from $80 a piece, which were priced to sell to rental houses, down to $19.95 and below, and saw huge increases in sales. In 1980, Walt Disney got in on the business, dipping into their catalog of family films. The video mark was so successful that 20th Century Fox turned around and even acquired Andrew Blay's company, Magnetic Video, reorganizing it into 20th Century Fox Video in 1980, which merged with CBS Video, another giant, in 1982, to become CBS Fox Video. Uh, the video market was big, big business. Now, not long after VHS hit the market came the first commercially successful 
optical disc format, the LaserDisc, originally marketed as the MCA DiscoVision in 1978. Still an analog format, but superior in many ways to VHS tape, LaserDisc was a huge hit with the cinephiles. I think you will not be wasting your money to invest $600 in a LaserDisc player because the quality is so much better that every time we mention a cassette on this show or on our regular show, I feel like people are getting cheated in a way because they're not buying a LaserDisc and so they're not getting the sound. Unfortunately, LaserDisc never really did get a foothold in North America. The extra costs of the players and the LaserDisc themselves meant that market penetration never rose above 1% of households, despite the perceivable quality advantage. The next breakthrough for home media would have to wait for computers and compression to bring digital to video. In 1993, roughly 10 years after the release of the audio CD, Philips introduced the VCD using a new digital compression called MPEG-1 to compress movie titles to fit onto two compact discs. VCDs enjoyed a brief window of success until Hollywood realized uh, that these VCDs were really easy to pirate. MPEG-1 had no copy protection whatsoever. Well, luckily in 1995, an alternative came in the DVD. This is DVD. And this is what happens when you watch DVD. Introduced by Philips, Sony, Toshiba, and Panasonic, the DVD used MPEG-2 compression on an optical disc, which was roughly the same size as the popular audio CD. With MPEG-2 compression capable of storing video, multiple audio tracks, and extras, the DVD did what LaserDisc couldn't and quickly became the preferred method for distributing movies for the home. But as our story progresses, the time scale gets more and more compressed, as DVDs, once king of home entertainment, would bow out to high definition and digital delivery in only a decade. High definition is the first format to begin bringing a real cinematic experience into the home. Now, there are many experiments in high definition in decades past, but it was digital that enabled the transmission of a higher resolution signal. HDTV, as outlined in ITU-R recommendation, ITU-RBT709-2 in 1990, sports a maximum resolution of 1920 by 1080 pixels, a major departure from the 640 by 480-ish standard definition resolution. Also new was the introduction of the new 16.9 aspect ratio. 16.9, or 1.78 as a decimal, was derived as a geometric mean between old Academy 4x3, 1.33, and the wide scope aspect ratio of 2.40. This 16x9 aspect ratio was a compromise, a way in which images pillar box to 4.3 or letter box to 2.4 would both get roughly the same number of pixels, or 1.5 megapixels of the available 2.1 megapixels of an HD image. With HDTV standards in place, surround sound, HD streaming over the internet, and Blu-ray discs released in 2006 and went on to win a much publicized, yet relatively short and uneventful format war with HD DVD in 2008, you now have elements necessary to create a really great home theater experience that it was certainly miles ahead of turn of the century Nickelodeons and movie houses. But for those that want the really big screen experience at home, home digital projectors are the way to go. Unfortunately, with the HD 16 by nine compromise, the films that Hollywood created to have the largest, most immersive feel to them, those shot at the scope 2.4 aspect ratio end up being the smallest content on a 16 by nine screen framed by black letterbox bars that are essentially wasted projection. Fortunately, there is an optical solution from a company called Panamorph. Working in the same fashion as Cinemascope anamorphic lenses, Panamorph uses the projector's scalar feature to stretch the image vertically and eliminate the black letterbox bars. This utilizes the full power and resolution of the projector.
Then a specially engineered panamorph anamorphic lens goes in front of the projector, stretching out the projection to 2.40 aspect ratio, restoring the correct screen geometry. This process results in projections that are 33% wider and 80% larger without sacrificing picture quality and a true recreation of the filmmaker's intent, creating that big immersive feel right in your home theater. Clever use of tried and true technology to solve our new digital challenges. Now we've taken film out of the Cineplex and brought them into our homes and even our own pockets. Now the media rich culture that we have today may not be recognizable even to those early days of home VCRs, let alone the pioneers of filmmaking. The fact is though, changes in technology have inherently changed our relationship to film. The story of cinema is a story of unrelenting change. Even as we speak right here, we're entering another radical shift with digital distribution. No one really knows how the cards will fall. It's going to be challenging times, of course, but with all great challenges comes great opportunities. Now more than ever, it's the time to go out there and make something great. I'm John Hess. I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com.